Okay. So yeah, I, um, I have, uh, as I said to Michael before the start, I could talk about ground beetles, I think, for a very long time, and we, we don't have as much time as we might like, but uh, advance notice, we do have a day in the field as well, I believe, coming up on 28th of July, when we could chat much more about beetles. So that will be something to look forward to. But um, for now, I'm going to just give you a quick, I think, overview of a couple of ways of approaching identifying ground beetles. Uh, and I will also touch very briefly on how to find them. Now, because survey is one of the things I've also been asked to talk about. Uh, to be honest, surveying ground beetles, I mean, the, the actual methods themselves are quite straightforward. It's actually uh, what you do with them once you have found them that is slightly more tricky because you're dealing with 360, 370 odd species in the UK. So the identification is probably the most challenging part. So the bulk of the talk will be uh, focused on that. Uh, this is me and the ground beetle recording scheme, sort of the hat that I'm wearing today. I'm also a lecturer at University of Reading and general wildlife enthusiast, I would say. Uh, definitely not just a beetle person, uh, lots of interest in birds and, and other things. My ground beetle recording scheme is something I sort of uh, accidentally acquired by uh, making myself look useful uh, and it's been a great journey. I, I took over the scheme in 2019. And I am hoping to make it much more of a team of people. Traditionally, a lot of the recording schemes in the UK have been um, almost like an individual that's a recorder. Uh, and a colleague still says, oh, yes, Chris is the national recorder for ground beetles. It's not the way I want to see it. It's far too big a group for one person to look after. Really, uh, I think we're moving towards these being teams, organizations, uh, schemes that anyone can participate in and be a part of. So I'm the facilitator of, of, the, of that scheme. And by no means the ground beetle expert, there are other people who know a lot more than me, but because I, I think I've, I've been learning stuff quite recently, I hope that does help me to make it accessible to you. Uh, I should say at the, right at the start too, if you have any questions as we go, feel free to butt in, come on camera, stick something in the chat, uh, and otherwise we'll pick up as many as I can at the end, uh, and we'll see how we get on. So just to give you a quick idea of the diversity we're dealing with, so 362 species based on the list that I'm looking at, but if you look at depends on the checklist in the year it's published. We're picking up the odd new species in the UK all the time and occasionally deciding that we don't have some or that two are one species and one or two. So the numbers fluctuate, but around 360 in 87 genera, which is quite a few. And again, traditionally, you would tend to approach a large group of insects like this by using a key. Uh, and there's an excellent one, or there's more than one excellent key available for ground beetles, but they can be quite intimidating uh, if you're just starting. So th th you're straight into looking at fairly obscure features. Uh, and what they don't tell you is actually, if you just looked at it, some of them are quite distinctive. And that's one of the things I will try and help you with to show you some species which you could recognize potentially out in the field um, with a good picture or a little hand lens. There are quite a few that you can get to grips with or at least have a, rough, a fairly good idea what they are. So it's a nice range. There, there are some species that are instantly recognizable, uh, like the green tiger beetle, and there are some which are definitely not, but it means there's a lifetime's worth of challenge in there, enough species to keep you going, um, but plenty uh, for those starting out to have fun with as well. There are lots of good images as well. There's lots of interesting ground beetles uh, throughout the world, really, but especially in Europe. Lots of good resources from different countries lots of experts out there so you can always get help with identifying these that are not they're, they're not too obscure so the first thing you do really need to do then is to go out and find some and sometimes that can be in just quite an ad hoc way the best way to get started finding ground beetles is by mistake really you, you're just walking around and you see one running about uh, and this this is one i just happened to see running across a path with a dead wasp that had scavenged and it's those incidental encounters where you often see the most interesting behavior. You weren't looking for something and you just happen to see it. And actually running across paths and roads, open areas, it's just a great way to see them. You see the movement, they like to move across an open area and you see a beetle running. They can be quite tricky to photograph at that point to get a good record or to catch because they're quite quick. But with a bit of practice, uh, and I'll show you some pictures like this later and something we could try now, on a field day, with a bit of practice, you can actually hold them quite safely, safety for the beetle and for you, and, and have a closer look. So that's something we can 
chat about. But that, that's my sort of number one tip for finding them is if you're outside, eventually there, there are common enough species that you'll see some. And this, this is another one I saw kind of by accident. I was out looking for night jars on Greenham Common, close to where I live, and this uh, large Carabus nemoralis, one of the big, uh, it's related to the violet ground beetle. This one has rather bronzy wings, little dimples down the wing cases, and this was just running across the path as I was out at night. Again, lots of them are nocturnal, so if you're out at night on any other sorts of surveys for nocturnal birds or bats, then you're very likely to see ground beetles again running around, especially on warmer nights this time of year. Fantastic. And then if you want to actually find a few more, you can do a bit more grubbing around. And these are a couple of pictures I took last summer uh, on some field boundaries. And again, it's an open area, gives you some access to the beetles, but they also quite like it. This was the interface between an arable crop and a margin. And there were loads of beetles. When we broke apart the, the clumps of soil, grubbed around under the bases of plants, sort of under the leaf rosettes, picked up stones, you will find ground beetles sheltering during the day. You will also see smaller ones running around in the sun. Again, the open terrain just helps you spot them. And that was a really good place. There were loads and loads and loads of uh, sort of open field beetles there. And then typically for a more formal survey, you would tend to use these. I'm sure some of you would have come across uh, using pitfall traps and there, there are lots of tweaks on the design but the basic idea is to bury a cup or a glass or a jar in the ground beetles will flush at the surface and beetles will run in now this one's been fitted with some clever channeling bars so that the, the beetles are going to kind of be filtered into the trap and um, but you you don't necessarily need to do that i usually set them with a lid to keep the rain out and then you can use a, a lethal collecting fluid uh, if you have facility to identify all of the species and, and store specimens uh, in a sensible way. But you don't have to do that. You can, if you're just going to have them out for a couple of days, you could just put some material in the bottom for, for shelter, a few stones and, and twigs and leaves and so on, and, and then just empty it into a tray and see what you have live. And that, that's a really fun thing to do in your garden. I, I did for a number of years, just keep a couple regularly to go and see what had gone in. And that, that works pretty much any time of year, but really they monitor when ground beetles are active. So when they're really actively moving about, because of course they're more likely to go into the trap when they're active. Uh, another profitable thing to do is to uh, rustle around in tussocks. And this is something which uh, a lot of uh, beetle people do in the winter a lot. Uh, I haven't done that much myself, so I can't necessarily tell you that much about it, but I put a couple of links there I can give you uh, to various blogs for people who are uh, quite keen on this method. So uh, a number of the species do overwinter as adult beetles and you find them tucked away in thick plant tussocks, uh, grass tussocks, uh, and you can break those open and run them through a big garden sieve and find all the beetles that are sheltering there for the winter. It's a great method. Uh, similarly, looking in flood debris where you've got a site with flood debris. So some of your more wet sites, and uh, understand you have a number of good wet-ish sites and wetlands can be a good place to look. Uh, and also not just in the winter, but any any time of year, I think any kind of interface where water has just lapped up and you get that edge, whether it's a river or a lake where you get the sort of edge of things being washed up, you often have invertebrates washed up with the water. And then you will find ground beetles scavenging along that interface. It's th There are some beach specialists that do it. There are river shingle specialists uh, and mud. So that is a, a really good place to look. I don't have a good picture to represent that, but it's the, it's the things that have come up out of water. And a lot of the kind of watery things will go into wet meadows, into the grass tussocks in the winter. Uh, another maybe surprising way of finding them is actually at light. So if, you, if you're someone who runs a moth trap, then you quite often get ground beetles come to light. And there are a number of species which are, are coming to light quite regularly, and we can learn quite a lot about their distributions from uh, light records. Now, obviously, these are these are records of individuals which are dispersing. Ground beetles prefer to stay on the ground; they prefer to walk, and they don't just fly as a part of their everyday existence. Generally, when they're flying, that's a dispersive phase, they're moving into a new patch of habitat. So it does tell us when things are moving around too. And that, that's kind of all I'm going to say on, on the survey. And I think most of the kind of more technical aspects of 
uh, if you wanted to do a, a formal survey, how many traps should you put and how close together and, and that sort of thing are things you can find out there in more technical manuals, which are less interesting to share now. But this just to give you an idea of the range of methods available to you. So I'll spend a lot more time looking at the identification. And I do also have some just some pretty pictures at the end if we get time to consider some of the more interesting aspects of their ecology too. And we'll we'll see. So that's, that's a rather characteristic species. Um, but the first question really, if you're trying to identify ground beetles, is probably, how do you know that it's a ground beetle you're dealing with? So this is, I, I'm taking this species to be my bog standard ground beetle. And this is Pterostichus madidus. Uh, with a p other uh, the name will be on the screen later i think i neglected to put it on this slide that's uh, a really really common species and one of the one one that you'll encounter most regularly and so if you if you go anywhere with ground beetles this is one you'll get to know really well with the uh if i can get a pointer somewhere possibly yeah if you look at the uh, the thorax on it so all insects divided into three head um thorax and abdomen if you look at the thorax, you've got this uh, sort of rounded thorax and at the back end. There's no kind of square angle or point or projecting spike or anything like that. It's just round. That's a good characteristic for the species. And it's quite chunky. It's generally black. And then there are two forms with black or red legs. So there are other species with a rounded thorax and and some are smaller and but this one is is the one that you will see a lot uh, and can quickly learn to recognize but that's a digression what what we're looking at here is just to use it as a typical ground beetle and you you'll see that it has quite long legs they're built for speed uh, they they run around many are predators most of them are predators and it's got big pointy jaws sticking out the front uh, some species really projecting and others less so some of the slightly blunter because they might eat more seeds in their diet but generally they do have quite strong protruding mandibles the segments always have 11 uh, antennae always have 11 segments if you have a good enough sharp enough picture to count segments but they're also what's called filiform they're not fancy and or ornamented in any way there's no club on the end they don't get wider as they go lots of other beetles you'll see those characteristics ground beetles it's just a little string of beads and that's all you'll ever see on our antennae. Oh, I'd look, I had some fancy red pointers I completely forgot about too. So uh, I don't know if anyone wants to kind of wave their hands at the chat and if I can see it. Uh, and for uh, just a quick challenge as to whether you think this is a ground beetle, based on what I've just said. If I was very clever, I would have prepared a poll, but I have not done that. But we have one no. It's a dung beetle. Yeah, so how did you know that's the question? Or what was the big clue on this picture? We're, we're a little shy to start with, or maybe I, I'm on a, yeah, there we go. Club antennae. Yeah, so it's got this obvious orangish club on the end. The antennae are thick at the base, then they're thinner, then they're thick again. Yes, yeah, so this is a door beetle, one of the dung beetles. Again, it's another one you see walking around on the ground, so it might be mistaken for ground beetle. But there are lots of clues to tell you it's not. Okay, let's try another one. How about this one? Ground beetle or no? No. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, that's that's another no. Um, one potential for ground beetle. So this one, uh, it just looks a little bit squishy and weak um, for a ground beetle. It's very rounded. It's not as streamlined. It's kind of curvy legs. So this is one of the leaf beetles, uh, the older leaf beetle, which you, yeah, I'm sure you'll have seen even if you didn't know what they were. Absolutely everywhere in the last few years. But it's not a ground beetle. Okay, that's the name. There's another one. I think, again, you'll get the hang of this now. You look at those antennae straight away. It's got many of the features of a ground beetle, 
for the antennae end of the giveaway. And it's also cheating because we don't have this species in the UK, sadly. Uh, but it, it's called Platyceris caraboides. And, and in other words, it looks a bit like uh, a ground beetle, but it's actually one of in the stag beetle family. Last one, I think. And what do you think? This one looks pretty good. No big jaws. Yeah. So that this one, you don't really see the mandibles and, it, and its head's quite round. So it's absolutely right. This this one is, again, yeah, it does have, it has 11 segmented antennae. Uh, and it it looks like some of the ground beetles quite strongly, but this is not a ground beetle. So there's another trick question. None of them are. This is probably the trickiest of the four. And this is the one that catches us out most often. I spent a long time when I first found this trying to figure out what ground beetle it was and then realized that it wasn't. So there's another feature you can look at on the underside which we won't go into. It's a bit more technical, um, but that's how I eventually figured it out. And this is one of the darkling beetles, a species with an almost unpronounceable but rather fun name. It's quite common, but not a ground beetle. But most things you see that look quite a bit like one are, so it doesn't get much more difficult than that. And there are lots of resources to help us. So the, the absolute Bible in the UK is this blue book by Martin Luff. Then there are lots of other supplementary resources. There are some great PDF guides for identifying them by John Walters and Mark Telfer, who was my predecessor at the recording scheme. And there are various other documents floating around on the internet too, and places I can point you to. And generally, when we go to identify something, um, so I, I'll just kind of give you these links later rather than talk about them all now, but there are lots of good uh, images as well. When we try and identify insects, there are kind of two approaches. And one is you take the, uh, it's the taxonomic approach. You're sat in a microscope looking very jolly as I am here and, and grinding through your key, always with a cup of tea at your side, trying to work out what it is. Um, but there is another way, I think, uh, which works anywhere. And that is what I would like to call uh, the birder style of doing it, where actually, when you are identifying a bird in the field, you're relying on a lot of different cues. You're relying on where you are, what you expect to see, your familiarity with species, um, just those few signs that let you know, oh look, that's got a white rump, it's flying with swallows, that one's not a swallow, it's a house martin. You've got things that you're looking for that you pick out. And you wouldn't have to grab the bird and just check every single feature and measure the beak and uh, check all the feather colors and measure the length of the wing, as you might if you're using a, a key. No, you, you have a few things which help you work it out based on uh, everything you know about it. And you can do exactly the same thing with beetles. So what I'm, what I'm going to do is, is this is primarily then not a talk about using microscope and doing it that way because it's a, a more advanced thing. But what I'll do is I'll skip through a few of the features that you will end up using if you decide to have a go, because there are lots of species where you do have to delve into the wonderful world of microscopic identification. And it also helps you, if you know those features, it does help you know what, if you're taking a picture, if you don't want to be taking specimens, but you're taking a picture, it helps you to know what to take pictures of, which parts of the insect have in focus. So I'll show you a few of those features, but I wouldn't expect you all to go away from this talk thinking, great, I know all those and I remember all that. It's really just a, a first look to help you if you open this book, know what it was you were looking for. And then I will try and go through a few species more in my birder style, where I'm giving you pointers for how to recognize them uh, in the field. So we'll, we'll try both approaches. Uh, so this is our bog standard Pterostichus madditus again, and a few of the features. If you're not familiar, many of you may well be familiar with other groups of insects. I don't know what training you've you've done already, and what courses you've done, and talks you've watched. Um, but just in case, I've put this in here to to help you um, with some of the things you might come across in terminology. Um, again, I won't read them all through, but they'll be on the recording and. Um, you can come back to me with questions as well at the end if you need to. But what, one of the things that does come up a, a lot with ground beetles, which is not obvious on this picture, if you can see just sticking out the side of the thorax, there are some very slender hairs. And the position of a lot of those hairs is sometimes quite important. And my red arrow, the first one, is pointing to 
of some pores or punctures which are where the hairs grow out of the body. And so, for example, one of the points in the key is, to, is asking you about the number of hairs next to the eye. So learning to look for hairs and get them in the right light and try and get those sharp can be quite useful in some cases. Uh, you're, you'll need to look at mandibles sometimes. And again, that hind angle, uh, it's often called the hind angle of the pronotum. So this top part of the, of the thorax is called the pronotum. It's the plate on the top. And the shape of that is really important for identifying some beetles. So pronotum is one of those words that will come up a lot. The mandibles will. And then the, the structure of the palps, which are these little apparatus, like mini antennae next to the mouth parts, and part of the feeding apparatus. So palps, pronotum, mandibles, pores or punctures. These are really important words that you won't necessarily remember straight away. And then the three parts of the leg as well. So you have the femur, the tibia, and then the tarsi. So much like our own legs, just in a slightly different structure. Too many red arrows here. And the last one is the wing cases, which in technical terminology are the elytra. And again, things about the elytra are often really useful for helping to identify the beetle. Now my slides are advancing automatically just then, which is interesting. Um, so what I did to help some of our, our students uh, at Reading University where I work is I, I translated that blue book into an illustrated key, just the first key in it, which goes through all the different tribes and the genera of, of the ground beetles. And it's still a little bit using the technical features, but I just want to find some good pictures to show some of them. I'm going to show you just some key highlights from that uh, and we'll see if they help before I get on to more of the pretty pictures further on. So the first thing to say is actually that there are a few subfamilies that you'll find straight away, and those are really easy. Uh, you've got the tiger beetles, they're very distinctive, generally green or bronze, but shaped like a tiger beetle with those great markings, huge, great uh, serrated mandibles, very fast, the, fast, the fastest insects pretty much uh, related to their body length. They are super speedy. If you've ever watched them run about, you'll know that tiger beetles and green tiger beetle, the Sycandela campestris, is quite abundant. It's one you'll find in a lot of open habitats, uh, woodland rides, heaths, uh, moorland. So you may well have local records for that one. And then the other tiger beetles are all much scarcer, and you have to go to particular special habitats to find them. Then we have the bombardier beetles, which are these brachinus in the brachinini subfamily. Blue or green, metallic abdomen, uh, the rest of it orange, all the appendages, head, uh, and they're just two species. And they're really distinctive, again, the two species in the genus Brachinus. And then we have this weird, shiny ladybird ground beetle thing, Amophron limbatum, which is a, a specialist on sort of sandy, or it's like a quicksand beetle, it's like sort of wet sand on the edge of sand pits and occasionally on the coast. Uh, and this, this is unmistakable for any other British beetle. And then all the other ground beetles are in their own subfamily. So 366 by the list measured here. So if you're starting with a subfamily key, uh, you can kind of skip. You can just look at these pictures and say, well, I know it's one of those or one of those, or it's not, and then you move on. Then when you turn over the page to the next part of the book, you immediately go into something a little bit technical about the structure of the front tibia. And I'm not going to read the text, but that's what's in the book. And it will tell you to look at the leg and see if there's a little notch in it or not. So if you're taking a picture again of a ground beetle in the field, it's really good if you can try and get something which shows the leg from the side, if you can, or a nice sharp picture of the front leg. Generally, from the shape of the beetle, you'll be able to tell what type it is anyway. It can be really helpful. And if you're working through a key and you don't know where to start, it's also really helpful. And what it is you're looking for is something with which they actually clean their antennae. So Quite a lot of the species have got this little groove and they run the antennae through their leg and it's like a notch that helps clean it. It's an antennal cleaner, just wipes it off, which is a nice feature. And that's what, so that's what you're actually looking for, something that you can imagine they could run their antenna through. But what that does, I always like to think about a key, it's thinking, well, where is it going to take me? If I go this way, which beetles am I looking at? And does the one I have look anything like those? And that isn't cheating, it's just helping yourself. Uh, and 
actually appreciating the whole animal you have in front of you for what it looks like. So for the antennal cleaner, um, what you've, what you, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> skipping forward here, um, you have not uh, too many genera to choose from. It's all of these. I won't go through them all. I'm going to go through some of the more distinctive species later. But you'll see again, you have a technical feature, but then you can also say, well, I can rule out some of these. So you've got the large uh, caribus species, which include the violet ground beetle, which you might well have seen. You've got uh, a few other quite distinctive things, and then some which are a little less so. But there are lots of clues, again, as to what these look like. You've got a couple of genera with really big bulging eyes. It's another thing in the key. Do they have really big eyes? It doesn't necessarily tell you how big they have to be before they're big. So you just find those things, look up pictures. There are lots of great pictures out there and you'll see how big the eyes are supposed to be. No Teophilus, some, but I'll show you those. And then you go through uh, a number of other groups, uh, which it also could be. And again, you've got distinctive features to look for, but I'm going to skip that for sake of time and, and try and look at some uh, more distinctive species. And there are a couple more which can be quite useful. And this, if you're just starting out, is for really tiny beetles. So I think I'm going to skip it generally and but about the structure of the palps. So I'll leave this in for interest if, if you uh, want to have a look. I'm quite happy to share, if they don't go too far, share some of the slides. But I, I have uh, borrowed a lot of this text from the book and probably uncopyrighted currently. So I can't really distribute this, but I can, we can chat about some of the features if, if you've got any questions afterwards. So it takes you to a number of that. That one feature takes you to a lot of really tiny uh, genera. So it, it does help you to know, well, if I've got a three millimeter gram beetle, uh, check for this feature of the palps where you've got this tiny little pin shape at the end. And my point is not very good, but if you look at the picture, on, you probably can't see it at all. I'm looking at my mouse. If you look at the picture on the left, you've got this little peg on the end of the palp. Uh, and they're the pin palps, genus Bembidian and some others. Uh, but they're, yeah, if you, you'll see a titchy one, and unless you, uh, I'm going to use a microscope to identify them. This is not a feature you'd probably look for because they're very small. Um, yeah, and that's another one that goes to some very small species. So look, well, let's skip that as well. I said I had more material than we could possibly get through. Um, but this one is very useful. So there are a group of quite distinctive species, and many of them have this pattern of uh, black with yellow spots or other patterns like that. And a lot of them are also more likely than other ground beetles to be found climbing up vegetation. So it's a really great group to get to know They're in a tribe called Labini. The tribe is just a collection of genera that are, are related to each other. And these have got uh, wing cases that look like they've been snipped off with a pair of scissors. So you get to the end of the elytra and there's a straight line as if they've just been cut. So they don't cover the whole abdomen. And that puts you straight into one of these genera lots of distinctive species within them and some are quite similar but they all look like members of this group so it's a really great group to know and the species pictured called dromius quadramaculatus because of the four yellow marks is one of the commoner ones you'll see very often climbing on tree trunks uh, i find it in when i used to help uh, clear bird nest boxes used to find it in nest boxes too it goes sheltering in holes in trees and that, that's just showing you some of the genera in that group where they're about to come back up again so we'll we'll skip to the last feature i think i want to talk about for now and then i'll then i'll go with the second idea approach and i hope it will begin to make some sort of sense to you and be of some more practical use but this one is useful to know about uh, just for separating a, a lot of groups so the punctures i talked about there are a, a, a lot of um bit ground beetles that have got two little hairs sticking next to the eye and they're usually at either side of the eye and I hope you can see them in the picture. Just two little hairs sticking out the top of the beetle. And this is just two pictures I took to prove that you, you can with them. This is not a clever camera. It's a kind of point and shoot with a macro feature. But not too expensive camera. You can do this in the field. Uh, and the other one you can see has got one hair sticking up in the middle. And immediately splits off relatively kind of to the to just casual glance, what look like quite similar beetles, splits them into different groups. So if, again, if you're taking pictures and you can get the head in focus, but from the side, so you can see the hair sticking up against the pale background, that's a really useful one. Okay, more of my magic red arrows. 
And let's skip where it goes because I'm going to talk about all of these genera in a minute. So let's have a look at actually identifying things from the general. It's the general impression, isn't it? The bird is jizz. What a general impression of size and shape, supposedly what it means. And I think this is, for me, actually having not done this first, I think this is probably an easier way to start getting into identifying some of the ground beetles. And the tiger beetles, as I said, are, are probably the, the easiest group to recognize just starting out. And the green tiger beetle is one that you'll know. Uh, and I, I've stuck in a few of the other rarer ones there. I'm trying to think in, in your area uh, which you'll have, but unfortunately they're mostly coastal uh, or more sort of southeast heathland. So probably just green tiger beetle, but correct me if I'm wrong. And then we have uh, another group, which again, you do encounter quite a lot in the field as accidental finds running across the path uh, and this these are the carabus and a couple of other uh, genera of big black or bronze or purplish metallic beetles uh, and a couple of spectacular things and this this is a really again great group for starting out with and there's plenty uh, of interest there too there are 11 species in the carabus this species in the middle citrus caraboides uh, is a snail eating beetle, that's why it's got the really extended mandibles and long face for getting into snail shells. That one doesn't, you can't confuse that with anything else with a good picture. Records of that are very acceptable. There's just one species like it, so that's a really good one. And the same with the Callosoma, there are two in the genus, really distinctive shape, very square. Uh, Sycophanta is very rarely in the country, sadly, because beautiful, beautiful thing. Inquisitor is quite scarce, I'd love to get more records of that. That's uh, a caterpillar feeder that spends a lot of its time, again, unusually for ground beetles, up in trees, climbing around on oak trees, hunting caterpillars. But the, the carabus include the violet ground beetle, which is, again, one of the most familiar ground beetles. And just uh, to trip us up, there are actually two species of violet ground beetle. And this is, I think, one of the most frequently uh, confused pairs of ground beetles. Uh, lots of the records I get for both of them are misattributed, so I have to spend a while sorting these ones out, which is fine, I like a challenge. Uh, and even I, um, they, they are relatively different, but if you get a picture from a slightly interesting angle or a bit fuzzy, then there are some where I, I spend a lot of time scratching my head. But if you look at the uh, one on the left, which is our classic violet ground beetle, Carabus violaceus, it's got quite smooth wing cases compared to the one on the right, which is problematicus. Uh, it's been given the common name ridged violet ground beetle to help you remember that feature. It's got stronger ridges on the wing cases. But those textures can be quite hard to see. And what I prefer is the shape of the pronotum again. So on the violet ground beetle, it's quite broad compared to the wing cases, quite square. Uh, on problematicus, the, the one that's a problem, they're narrower at the base, they're raised up a bit more, it kind of comes up and then narrows, narrower than the base of the wing cases. It also actually tends to be a bit more violet than the violet ground beetle. Funnily enough, violet ground beetle can often be more bluish or just violet around the very edges. Whereas the, the ridged violet ground beetles can be very strongly violet across the whole pronotum or more of the pronotum. It's also a bit shorter, uh, tends to be smaller. Uh, and when you, the more you look, the more they look different. And then they don't, and then they do, and then they don't. And it took me quite a while to sort them out. So don't worry if it does for you as well. But they're both quite common species. I mean, they've probably both declined a bit, but they're still a very widespread. And you'll see both. Uh, likewise, Carabus nemoralis. This one's pretty frequent in gardens as well. Actually, it seems to like urban areas almost more than the others do. And it's got these very similar to the violet ground beetle, but with bronze wing cases and these little dimples uh, down the wing case. So three uh, really nice, quite common Carabus to look for. And then the other one I occasionally get misattributed records for is the blue ground beetle, because people see a bluish violet ground beetle and think it must be the blue one. The real blue ground beetle, which is very rare and only in Devon and in South Wales, in this country, it is much bluer and also a very different shape. It's got strong ridges again, much like Problematicus, with a very narrow pronotum, very long, narrow jaws. It's a, sna a slug specialist, this one, and it's, it's big. So it's really it's quite distinctive in its own right. 
It's a bit like the bird thing again. It's almost difficult to describe why it's different to the other two, but you look at it and you can see that it's a picture of two different species. So it's just about familiarity sometimes. And there are a few greenish caribus too, and um, these are definitely worth having in mind if you're out surveying more open habitats because the, the greenish ones tend to be more species of grassland, moorland. So the one on the left is caribus swoops. I haven't named them for some reason, so that's not very helpful. But the, the one on the left uh, is at the top. Okay, the one on the left is caribus granulatus. Uh, spot the typo I just have. And it's got these big strings of sausages down the back. And then you have the one in the middle with slightly subtler strings of sausages is Arvensis. There's another tricky-ish pair, but good top-down photos showing the shape. We can, we can separate those. And granulatus is kind of wet, open places. It's quite common. Arvensis tends to be more heath and moor uh, and slightly drier places. And then got a real grassland specialist in Monilus on the right. So grassland, the arable field edges, a slightly scrubby grasslands. And this is a very much declined species. Uh, the colours kind of vary from bronze to green, so don't set too much store by the difference in colours there. They can be all of these, but it's really the structure. Again, Caravus monilus has got very fine uh, ridges, um, more so than the other two. And the, the little sausagey bits are separated by seven by three. Ridges. So there's some fine stuff, but there's a really great guide to Caribus in the in John Walter's website, which which I had a link up for for helping with those. But Monilus, I think, is, is very much declined, but it is one uh, we still have at the University of Reading campus. Actually, I'm very pleased and very proud to say, and and I think we, I'd like to get a handle a better handle on where it still is. And I'm sure there will be good grassland sites in Wiltshire where um, there are undetected populations. It'd be really great to have more records for Caribus monilus. So keep an eye out for big Caribus and, and see what you find. And then the other way I've split the rest of the species up, um, because there are lots of genera, is to just kind of put them into categories of, well, roughly what colour and roughly how big it is. Um, size is a bit subjective, but I think we generally have an idea of what counts as a big beetle and what counts as a, a small one. Um, because we've got about half the ground beetles, unfortunately, uh, are predominantly black, brownish, uh, sometimes a bit metallic. And about a third of those are common, so we're dealing with uh, probably 60 or so species, which are blackish, small to medium ground beetles uh, that are relatively common. So you can see that's where the identification challenge really starts. So about 60, which causes more trouble. But again, when you start looking at them, there are differences you can pick up on. So here are some of the smaller ones. And having scale in your picture, again, is really useful. It's difficult. Sub size is a bit subjective. But if you have a ruler with it, you stick it next to the beetle, or you're able to just put your hand next to it, or you picked it up and it's next to a thumbnail, and you can measure your, your hand, then you have some idea of the size. And indeed, if you have a specimen, you can just measure it. And that really narrows things down very helpfully. So we have things like the Bembidian, with lots of small metallic dark species, but all about four millimeters. Uh, we have a couple which are in the snipped off elytra group. So, so you can look for that feature. And then we have this genus called Pterostichus that I introduced you to a bit earlier, very much the generic uh, blackish ground beetles. So this is where they're going to get difficult and having a, an identification from a picture will be tricky. Uh, but there are things you can look for, but too many species to actually go through them all, sadly. And the same with the, the medium-ish ones, more, more genera. One you'll see a lot of is Calathus, and I'll show you some of the more distinctive species on their own special slide in, in a second. Um, but there are, uh, again, quite a few genera of mostly darkish medium size. But this is one that you could identify in the field quite nicely. This is a field picture I took. It's called Larissa pilicornis. It's a lovely bronze metallic sheen to it. And it has these pairs of dimples uh, on the, or punctures on the wing cases. And really importantly, it's got these long hairs on the antennae. And no other ground beetle in the UK has got such bristly antennae. It's a very bristly antennae, a medium sort of eight millimeters or so, and pairs of big punctures. That's Larissa pilicornis. 
the only one in its genus. Quite easy to recognise. Uh, some more species which are, are doable, certainly from decent pictures, and sometimes in the field are the Lystus. And we've been talking about mandible structure. Lystus have got massive, great plate-like mandibles. They're specialist hunters of springtails. And there are a few, a few darkish species which are still quite easy to separate. There's a bluish one called Spinibarbus. Uh, there's one with a really broad, round uh, pronotum called Fulvabarbus, quite orangey legs. And there's one with orange edges around it called Rufo marginatus from the name. And again, from good pictures, those are all uh, doable. And then what's really irritating is that other really, really, really common ground beetle is Nabria brevicollis. It's a very generic looking, again, medium size, medium to large ground beetle. But there is a joker in the pack because there are two uh, species which look exactly like this. The only difference is tiny little hairs on the hind tarsi. So actually, you can take a lot of pictures, and I'll tell you, it's one of those two. 99% of them will be Nibria brevicollis, the species pictured here, but there's another species it could be. So if you can take specimens of those, or if you can get pictures of the hind legs that are really sharp, you know, for something you think might be a Nibria, that could really help us get a record. And it is quite, it's related to the Lystus too, and sometimes confused, but just to point out, the Lystus always has this slight blue sheen. Uh, whereas Nebria does not. So if you've got a bluish sheen, look to Lystus first for the, with those big mandibles too. Um, Calathus is another one you see out in open habitats. Uh, another few really common species, especially Calathus rotundicollis and Fuscopes, orangish legs. Uh, and I hope you can see that they're different if I go back to Nebria. Nebria's got this lovely sinuate thorax. Calathus is much squarer, something with a very square thorax, uh, and otherwise, a very, again, a very generic looking ground beetle you may well be dealing with Calathus. Calathus also have uh, little teeth on the inside of their claws. So there's another one where if you have one under a microscope uh, and you think it might be Calathus, just look at the claws and then you've got it. Uh, but it's quite a difficult thing to look for on a live specimen. Another one here uh, called Plotinus, and I know this is an overwhelming number of species. Um, this, is, this one likes kind of damp woods uh, and uh, sort of leaf litter, quite wet situations. And it's got a very distinctively shaped, very narrow and sinuate pronotum. Another about some 9 to 12 millimeter species. Then there are a few really chunky ones. And uh, again, there are a couple which you can recognize in the field. Uh, Abax is one, it's called Abax parallelopipedus, which is one of my favourite names. It's parallel because it's parallel sided all the way down, right from the thorax through the abdomen. It's just a big long rectangle in a way that other species are not really. So Abax with practice again is one that you can recognise easily from a top down image. Another one that's quite easy to recognise uh, in the field is this one, Harpalus rufopes, really, really common in open dry places, uh, gardens, basically anywhere. And it's got this yellow dusting of hairs all over. So if you can get it at the right light, you will see those yellow hairs. And you know you have half of the roof piece. There is a rare species that looks a bit like it has the yellow hairs, but smaller, slightly different shape, and you basically never find it. So you're pretty confident you've got Harpalus roof, Harpalus roof of piece with those yellowish hairs. I put this massive, great coastal species on the left too, but I'm afraid you're not going to find that in Wiltshire, so we won't dwell on it. This Sarterostichus madatus again, just to reinforce that rounded pronotum, rounded quite in general, and with red or black legs. It's particularly easy to recognise in the, the red-legged form, because there are fewer other medium-sized to large ground beetles with red legs. I skipped ahead and talked about um, the Abax already, um, but this is just to compare Abax to another of uh, couple of species which are quite similar. Now we're dealing with like two centimetres. So we've got up to the really big ground beetles. Uh, and there are two, again, common Pterostichus species, which you may have, which again, from top down good images, rather than dwelling on exactly how you identify them now, um, you will be able to split those two Pterostichus from the Abax, which has got its straight edges. That's another nice picture of Harpalus for you, um, just scavenging. Uh, a dead chafer. 
And there's another harpalus which is quite common called a thinnis. And this has got hairs on the wing cases too, but they're just around the outside. And it comes in a nice rainbow of metallic colours. So these are very often metallic green, bronze, sometimes just black, but always with the hairs just on the outside. Harpalus to me look very bull-necked, very broad, uh, relatively blunt mandibles. They're the generalist species, but the, the larvae are specialist seed predators, if you like. They, they eat weed seeds. They actually provision their burrows with seeds over the winter. They make a burrow, they bring seeds down, but like a squirrel or something. Some, some nice behaviours there. The cat's just joining in. <laughs> and there are also... Uh, a lot of brownish species. So again, I'll go through a few of these very quickly. I'm conscious of time and the noisy cat. <laughs> I think he's about to be extracted from the room. Um, so there are a couple of uh, Leicester species, again, with the big plate-like jaws, which are uh, more of a brownish color. And Ferrugineus is, I think, the one you'll see quite often in Wiltshire. Uh, Terminatus, probably less likely to find that one. And then a couple of good uh, uh, garden species, I say that because I've, I've had them in, in my old garden, with unusual shapes. So again, if you get a decent picture of them, they're relatively small, sort of 8 millimeter species, but they've got very distinctive shapes. Very narrow uh, pronotum, the species on the left called Oxysilaphus, and they're both the only species in their genus. So if you get that shape generally down, then you've got that species. And the one on the right has got super long mandibles. Uh, and that's called stomis. And if you're if you're back on a wetland situation, this is the one I always find on the edge of water. It's called Parancus albipes, and it's really easy to recognise. Very very yellow legs, uh, pale legged species, kind of brown through to black, a reddish brown, but very very distinctive with those very pale legs. And I think the the final two sets there. There's one which is greenish things and another which are color, color patterns so we're, we're almost on the home stretch here in the metallic greeny species uh, again you have a lot of small to medium quite similar and then some which are really distinctive uh, so you'll see a lot of amara if you're out in the day the amara are very oval quite parallel sided again and this is the species amara inia you always see running around in the sun but amara is a annoyingly tricky genus to get to grips with and i haven't yet so very unlikely to start just identifying Amara just like that. So they need really good sharp images and it's kind of a topic for its own workshop really. And a related genus called Curtinotus, which are slightly different. They're a little easier to recognize where the pronotum doesn't quite join up. But as you can see, another generic-ish looking beetle. One you'll see a lot of in grasslands is Poacillus, and this is the green version of Pterostichus. So if you're at the point in the key where you've got Pterostichus, features but it's green you'll have poacillus and if you're taking pictures of poacillus it's really great to have images of the top of the head and the back legs you've got bronzy green beetles without hairs on the wing case because that might make it a harpalus then you'll probably have poacillus but number of bristles on back leg is a key species for a couple of splitting a couple of them so this is poacillus cupreus for example which has got a finely punctured head um, and Poacillus versicola is the other one, is smooth. Uh, quite difficult to see, but you can do it from pictures. And then just to actually help us out, as well as the tiger beetles and some we looked at earlier, there are other species which have quite colourful patterns. So a lot of those uh, short wing case ones have colour, good colour patterns, and there are a number of others as well. So there are a few species that look like this, orange at base to the wing cases, orange down the middle, uh, so again, decent images of those, and you can figure out which one you've got. And then there are a few that look like this, with the yellow spots on a darker background. And as well as actual the kind of shape of the insect and the precise colours, of course, where you are and the habitat you found is really important. So, for example, the Canadromius in the middle, very similar to Dromius, uh, but you find it more in conifers, where Dromius is more a, a deciduous species. So that Things in your record like, I got it from this type of tree, this location, really, really useful. And so, I mean, I don't know how you're going to be using your information necessarily when you get ground beetles, but uh, we'd also love to have uh, any records for the recording scheme. So I think I, I just want to finish by 
looking at some tips on making records and uh, something we want to do try and generate more data uh, and just to give you an idea why we might want to do that um ground beetles again it's a good size of group and they also cover cover the range of uh categories in terms of their status so we have a lot of threatened species endangered species on the list and some that you are potentially likely to find like that grassland carabus carabus manilus uh, which would be really great to have records for uh, so i think there, there's definitely work to do there's a lot we don't know still although it's one of the more popular groups of beetles uh, there's still loads we do not know about so many ground beetle species and there are lots of potential threats to them which you might expect but the, the, the one thing i wanted to pull out from the last status review which my predecessor at the scheme wrote is he said at the in the introduction to that there's an enormous scope for individuals and institutions to make valuable contributions to understanding the distribution habitats and ecology of the species covered by this review this enormous scope for individuals and institutions to make a contribution is partly i hope why we're all here and there's some good stuff again i can give you if you want to look at the scientific background for for ground beetle trends i can uh, give you links to hopefully copies of papers somewhere and then when we get your data, this is where it ends up. Uh, the ground beetle recording scene, we're up to about 400,000 records, may now have surpassed that. Um, and if you add in other sources of data, uh, the NBN Atlas has approaching 600,000 records, dating back to at least 1839. And the newest ones came in, always come in today, because people are always kindly submitting new records. I tend to take them through iRecord, uh, if that's the platform you've used for other groups before that's the preference but also very happy to receive things by email and we're looking for more always more people to join in and when you make a record and you've done this for other groups the basics are what is it where is it when did you find it and if you add in other details like how you found it and the notes on where you found it and what it was doing what it was interacting with it and first of all it, it makes it easier to verify the record is correct but it also just adds value to that record. We can learn more from it. Um, and I can go through, this is a kind of quick I record run through, which you can go through if anyone's not familiar with it. Um, but I wanted to just point out that uh, although 600,000 records sounds like a lot, and there's really good coverage for ground beetles, I kind of zoom in on my neck of the woods. I'm over uh, on the east of that picture in Newbury Thatcher Moyes. I'm that big, I'm in Newbury, uh, and I assume you're all distributed around Wiltshire somewhere. But you'll see that there are lots of parts of uh, all the counties in this area where there are no records at all. So it'd be very easy to go out and get brand new information. And if you're taking a picture record, sometimes even the dodgy pictures can actually be uh, enough. So one that I used in the talk already of Carabus nemoralis, the bronze ground beetle. You can see the dimples, you can see the colour. Uh, that's good enough for an identification. Harpalus rufopes, again, uh, as long as you're happy to just rule out the chance of having the really rare version. Those yellowy hairs on the back, half of the roof would be straight away and a moth trap. And one of the species that does commonly come to light. And again, if you're, if you're out in the field, one thing you can do to try and get those photo records uh, verified to get a sharp picture is to handle the beetle. This is something we can try in the field. I'm definitely not a wizard yet, but I'm getting better. They're really quite robust. You can pick them up between a, a thumb and forefinger and just hold them by two legs. And they'll wriggle a bit, but if you get fairly firmly, then it's not too difficult to handle a ground beetle in the field and get a good picture and then release it unharmed, if that's how you prefer to record things or don't have the capacity to, to deal with specimens. And we're learning a lot from uh, all the new records coming in from dis different sources. Uh, a lot of species like this lovely thing, Polystichus, um, apparently increasing with climate change, for example, coming in. Uh, at light, when we get some of these really hot weather events and lots of ground beetles start moving around. This is one of the species that's suddenly popping up in new areas. It used to be coastal, but now in lands. So that's one. If you're running moth traps, this is a, a really great one to look out for. Um, and this is another one, Ophonus, the bluish, um, quite similar to some of the Harpalus, but, but blue, the orange legs. So it's quite distinctive. Another simile, we've suddenly got lots of new records recently. And a few of the uh, other kind of scarce coastal species suddenly cropping up uh, on farms in land. These are two that have done recently. 
which are worth just keeping an eye out for in places you wouldn't expect to see things. And one of the things, and uh, you might be able to fit this into what you're doing with Action for Insects, one of the things that we have participated in in the last year uh, are these targeting revisits map, which the Biological Records Centre put together for a number of groups. And uh, basically they've, they've mapped all of the records uh, in the scheme and they've color coded the, the one kilometer square with those records in based on uh, whether it's been visited just once or whether it has been visited more than once. If it's been visited more than once and has records for any ground beetles, they can add it into their trends analysis and we can learn more about what's happening to ground beetle species. Uh, so the pink squares on the map are places where if you went and recorded any ground beetles, it can be literally any, it doesn't have to be the same species recorded before, then you are adding uh, to the, the power of their uh, science, uh, making the models more accurate for what's happening with ground beetles. So it's worth having a look at that in your area and saying, ah, well, I've got a pink square just up the road and there might be a good site for recording there or there's a Wiltshire Wildlife Trust Reserve in that one kilometre square that's currently pink. Let's go there and record some ground beetles. And then, you, then you've you've uh, hit two purposes at once, new information for the reserve and new, new trend information for the scheme. So that, that's a great thing to look at. I'll leave it there and uh, then if anything, I can use some of the other pictures if anything comes up in questions. I'm going to go back to the... I'll stop sharing for now and then I can see you. Thanks Chris, that was brilliant. Uh, it really gets me, uh, I don't know about everyone else, but it really gets me enthusiastic about going out and uh, looking. Yeah, actually, well me too, me too actually, I, I yeah. wish I had spent more time doing so. You've actually cost me quite a lot of money, Chris, because I like to go and buy all the books. Ah, well, yes. <laughs> they don't all have... Yes, the, the blue one's definitely the place to start, which is not too pricey, I think. Yeah. But, yeah, well, there's I, plenty of good ones out there. Just from my sort of experience, you know, it's exactly what you said. It's just about getting familiar with them. And uh, I think it's a really great idea, what you said, about doing it in your back garden, because yeah. you're going to... You know, maybe you'll get some rare ones, but um, hopefully you'll get some common familiar ones that you'll see quite a lot. So I really yeah. re recommend that to everyone. I, I got that from Chris's last talk. So, um, okay. So I just wonder if anyone's got any questions. Um, but while we're waiting, if there is any, I was just wondering, Chris, the grain beetles, because um, I see quite a lot of them at my at my allotments when I'm digging mm -hmm. and things like that, do they actually live up, do some of them live kind of in the soil or, or they yeah, mainly surface? The, mainly, mainly surface, but they will go into the soil in cracks for, for shelter, uh, either over winter or sometimes if you get sort of difficult conditions for breeding, say very hot in the summer, they'll go further into the ground uh, just to find cooler soil. Um, but also the larvae tend to be a bit more subterranean than the adults, so you might find more ground beetle larvae there. It does depend on the species too. There are some which are more, there, there's a group um, with uh, quite mole-like front legs, which are subterranean species. There are a few which are, most of them are, are more surface, but when they're active. So yeah, you might find them when you dig, just yeah. not doing much. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that, re that reminds me, actually, uh, another good tip that I've learned from your talks is, you know, what you said about kind of the, like you would if you were bird watching, you know. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you pick up a key and you go through every single part of the key to get to it. And, you know, like me, it goes to the wrong species. But actually, you can narrow it down to, you know, only a few species just by looking at, like you said, the mole. Sort of yeah. Tarsier in the front or things like yeah that. it's just kind of using that all the information you have and also what the whole thing looks like yeah. i sometimes find it difficult to describe you put two species next to each other and you can see that they're different and saying why can be difficult but you can see that they are and you you can if you've got the one you're trying to identify in front of you you can generally say well it's that one and not that one yeah that's yeah. where i think the images are so helpful and the some of the more the traditional key approaches don't give you that perhaps because the resources weren't there to just take all the the images or have the time to you know draw 360 species yeah that we yeah. haven't intended to have them i mean the the pic the pictures in the back of the of the martin luff guide are 
pretty good. They're not all there, but so it gives you an indication of whether you're on the right track. Yeah, perfect. Okay. okay. And um, one one other little question I just wanted to ask is um, I'm quite interested in uh, recording um, ant species on some of our reserves because obviously yeah. they've got a really an important role in biodiversity and things like that. Yeah. And I just wondered, is there any uh, growing beetles that are associated with ants? Ants nests or anything like that? I cannot think of any off the top of my head. Um, I know there are other beetles which are, yeah. um, but ground beetles I can't think of any. Yeah, no problem. Okay, okay cool. cool. But if I do, if I if I come across any, I'll, I'll let you know. Also, we, we might, might find, find some. some. Yeah, you never know. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, um, I think everyone's a bit shy with their questions, or perhaps you've answered all of their questions. So um, perhaps you could just uh, just mention again about the field meeting. Yeah, sample. I'm just I've just stuck my email address in in the chat, so do feel free to copy and paste that if you do have anything you want to ask afterwards. I will do my best. Won't necessarily be that fast, uh, but I'll do my best to help with any further ground beetle questions. And yeah, 28th of July. Um, I I don't remember the name of the place we're going, so you'll have to remind me. <laughs> sample. Okay, and I'm sure you you all know it better than me, but it'll be really great to see some of you there, and we'll just have a as uh, Michael said. We'll have a nice day out looking for beetles, something I'd like to do more of. Fantastic. All right, that's brilliant. Okay, well, I really appreciate you uh, giving this talk. It's, uh, you know, it's taking time out of your busy schedule, so I know how busy you are. So um, uh, on behalf of everyone, I'd Pleasure. like to thank you and see you, see you in July. And thank you, and really great to see so many people uh, here. Uh, it's great to have all the interest. So, yeah, looking forward to it. Perfect. All right. Thanks very much. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Chris. Cheers.